I don't know what went wrong with Zoom, but now it seems this one's working. So let's just wait for everyone to join. Okay, so we're losing too much time. I'm just going to start the session and then others can just watch the recording. I'm not sure what went wrong here. Uh, the screen. Okay, hello everyone and welcome to the first mixed mode session of programming languages, semantics and verification. Uh, I have a bunch of announcements first. Well, the first announcement is that the course is in mixed mode now. So feel free to take part in person. And it will remain like this until, until the end of March. And then we will switch back to online on April 1st. And uh, today is going to be the last lecture of the module on infinite duration games on graphs. And tonight is also the deadline for homework three. So, don't forget to submit that. And your first submission should get to us by the end of tonight, but then you can resubmit, of course, as much as you want. And another thing that I wanted to say was that I put some lecture notes for lecture six, and it seemed that many of you liked it. So I'm just going to put lecture notes for all of this module on Canvas. Okay. So let's just get into what we have to uh, cover today. The main topic that I'm going to cover today is basically parity games. And then if we have time, which is kind of unlikely, we can go to the next module and talk about automata on infinite voids as well. So let me just find this chat. Chat is uh, so we've already seen reachability and safety games and also bookie games and their duals, which are co-bookie objectives. And now we're going to talk about parity games in this session. And well, our setting is that we have a two player zero sum infinite duration graph game, which, is, which consists of a set of vertices V. V1 is the vertices that belong to player one and V2 are the vertices that belong to player two. And now we also have this priority function, which basically assigns one of t plus one possible values between zero to t to each one of our vertices. And we are assuming that the objective of player one is uh, the parity objective with respect to this priority function. So what he wants to do is to make sure that the smallest priority that is seen infinitely many times is even. And because we always assume that our games are zero sum, uh, we, by definition, know that the objective of player two is parity of t plus one. And this was because parity was the duality itself. If you remember, we talked about the duality between safety and reachability, bookie and co -bookie, and then the dual of parity with the function p was just parity with the same function, except that every parity is increased by one. Or if we don't have priority zero, we can actually also decrease the parity by one, and these are the same things. So the main question that we should answer before being able to even define the problem and before being able to uh, say who has a winning strategy is whether this game is determined at all. So in the previous cases, what you saw was that we kind of got determinacy for free. And the reason behind this was that we basically found a set of states where player two could win 
at the winning strategy. And then we showed that the, in, in the complement of this set of states, player one has a winning strategy. So we kind of got determinacy for free. We didn't really have to talk about determinacy. But in this case, that's not exactly that easy. And also another problem that we have is whether players will have memoryless winning strategies. So it might be the case that there are some winning strategies, but they're not memoryless. Uh, thankfully, in the case of parity, we still have memoryless strategies and we have determinacy, but we can no longer just go into finding the winning sets and then come back to this. We have to do everything at the same time. So what I'm going to do now is that I'm basically going to do an induction and I'm doing to do induction on the number of priorities. And what I want to prove in this induction is basically several different things. I want to prove that uh, the game is always determined. I also want to prove that players have memoryless winning strategies. And I also want to, at the same time, come up with an algorithm for computing the winning. So just have this in mind that everything that I'm saying right now is inside a giant induction. Okay. And so I'm doing induction on the number of priorities. This is not exactly D. What I mean by the number of priorities is the number of priorities that we actually have in the game. So we might, for example, have a case where uh, this function does not map anything to zero. In that case, I will have one fewer priority. So I'm doing induction on the number of priorities that actually appear in the game. Okay, so First, I can have some assumptions that simplify my life a little bit. So without loss of generality, I want to assume two things. First, I want to assume that either zero or one appears in, in my game. So I will either have a priority zero vertex or a priority one. Why can I assume this? Because, well, if I don't have this, I will just decrease all the priorities by two. And I just continue this over and over again until I get to a game that is essentially the same game, but I have priority zero or one in it. And then the second assumption that I want to have is that my priorities are contiguous. So basically what I mean by this is that if I have one and I have three, I also have two somewhere in my game. Why can I assume this? Well, suppose that they are not contiguous. Suppose that for example, I have, let's say in my game, I have priority I, and then I don't have priority i plus one, then I, the, the first next priority that I have is i plus two. So because these are of the same parity, I can just merge all the vertices with priority i and priority i plus two, and the game does not change. And if this is, for example, i plus three, then well, I can just replace all of these with i plus one, and the game does not change. So in any case, I can just merge these things or change their parities and change their priorities without changing their parity so that I can make sure that all of the parities that actually appear in my game are contiguous subsets. Okay, now that we have these assumptions, our life is a little bit easier and we can actually talk about how to do this induction. Uh, okay, so every induction should start with its base case. Uh, what are our base cases here? Well, we are doing the induction on number of priorities. So the base cases are when we have only one priority or when we have two different priorities. So if we only have one priority, the game is trivial. And that's because, well, if the one priority that you have is even, then player one always wins. And if the one priority that you have is odd, then player two always wins. So there is nothing to really solve here. And of course it is determined and the strategies are of course memoryless because it doesn't matter what strategy you use. So you can use any memoryless strategy. Now, what if you have two priorities? Well, because of these assumptions that we have here, if we have two different priorities, then we are, these priorities are either zero and one, in which case this is a bookie game, or the priorities are one and two, in which case this is a co-bookie game. And we already know how to solve bookie games. So the base cases are fine. And also we know that bookie games and co bookie games are memoryless determined. So let's go and do the induction step now. So let's say that we have more than two priorities. 
I, I want to use another without loss of generality here. We can always assume that we have at least one vertex of priority zero. Why? Because if I don't have a priority zero vertex, I just dualize the game and look at it from the point of view of player two. And then I can basically decrease all the priorities by one. This was what we had here, that the objective of player two is basically parity of P minus one. So this assumption also works. I can always assume that I have priority zero. So now finally, I can really say that my priorities are zero to D and all of them actually appear in the game. So I have D plus one different priorities. Now, what does the induction hypothesis tell me? It tells me that for any parity game with D priorities, there is memoryless determinacy. So if you have a parity game that has just one fewer priority, then you can be sure by the induction hypothesis that uh, it's determined and people have memoryless strategies. Okay, now how should we solve our game? So the basic idea is that we have to get rid of one of the priorities so that we can use induction, right? And it turns out it's much easier to get rid of priority zero. I don't know why I wrote parity here. This should be priority. Okay. So uh, basically what I want to do is to somehow get rid of all the vertices that have priority zero and obtain a sub game and then do induction and solve it in the sub game. And remember what we meant by a sub game. A sub game was basically the game that we played on a subset of vertices, a subset W of vertices. And the only condition that we needed in order to be able to do this was that every vertex in W should have a successor in that same set W. So that when we get this uh, graph that is basically limited to the vertices of W, it should actually be a well-defined game. Okay, but it's not just that easy. If I just remove all the vertices of priority zero, what I get is not necessarily a soft game. You can easily come up with examples where if you remove all vertices of priority zero, what you get doesn't make any sense at all. So what can we do? Okay. So here's where I'm going to actually give you the algorithm at the same time that I prove memoryless determinacy. So let's say that I have a set P0 and these are all vertices of priority zero in my game. So I define P0 as all those vertices whose value of P is zero. okay? And just like the previous cases, like the case of reachability and bookie, I compute the attractor of P0, the attractor for player one of P0 and I call it A. So this set A here is basically the set of all vertices from where player one can force the game to visit P0, okay? And then just like the previous case, I get its uh, complement and I call that B. And we have previously shown that B is actually a trap for player one. So player two can ensure that the game remains in B forever if you're in B. Okay, so we can define a sub game on B. Why? Because, well, we showed in the bookie lecture that we can define sub games on, on traps and B is a trap. So we can definitely define a sub game on B. Now, what's nice about this sub game is that it doesn't have any priority zero vertex because by definition, all the priority zero vertices were in P zero, which is a subset of A and B was the complement of A. So the game that I have in B, the sub game that I have here has fewer priorities. It, at most it has D priorities, it might even have less than D. But anyway, by induction hypothesis, I can say that this game, the sub game in B is determined. So I can basically divide the vertices in B into two different sets. And this is what I'm going to do in the next slide. So I can divide the vertices in B into B1 and B2. And here basically B1 is the set of vertices from which player one has a winning strategy, but this is not in the original game. It's only in the sub game that was restricted to B, right? And B2 is the set of vertices from which player two has a winning strategy. And this is also again in the sub game that is uh, restricted to B. Okay, now I have a bunch of claims uh, 
that helps us solve the original game based on this uh, set of winning sets in the uh, in the sub game. So the first claim that I have is that if you start the original game anywhere in B2, player two has a winning strategy. So I'm not talking about the sub game anymore. By definition, player two had a winning strategy in the sub game if we started in B2. But I say that even in the original game, he has a winning strategy. And what is the winning strategy? It's just play your strategy in the sub game because B was a trap. And if he just keeps playing his strategy in the sub game, player one has no way of exiting the sub game and then player two will win. So this claim was quite easy to prove. Okay, now what I say next is that, okay, so I know that player two wins everywhere in B2. And I also know that uh, my objective is a parity objective. And in the very first lecture of this module, I showed you that parity objectives are tail objectives. So what it means is that you can basically ignore any finite prefix of your game, right? So what I can do is that I can actually compute, now that I know player two wins in B2, I can compute the attractor of B2, the attractor of player two, and call that C. So this would be something like, for example, this. And I call it C. And then, so, yeah, I'm really bad with drawing. C contains all of B2. So, in all of the vertices in C, if we start the game there, player two can force the game into B2. And after he does that, he can win the game, right? So actually every vertex in C is a winning vertex for player two. And note that he has a memoryless strategy. Why? Because, well, if you are in a vertex of C that is also in B2, you just played the memoryless strategy that you had in the sub game. And if you're somewhere here, uh, in the reachability lecture, we saw that you have a memoryless strategy that forces the game into B2. So you first use that and then again use your sub game strategy. It's memoryless anyway. Okay, so I now found a set C from which I know that player two always wins and has memoryless strategy. Now everything is quite similar to the bookie case. So you just remove C because you know that player two could win everywhere in C and just recursively solve the rest of the game, right? And again, why, why can I do this? Why is the rest of the game a sub game? Because, well, C was the attractor two of B2. So the complement of C is a trap for player two and traps are sub games, right? So I basically just remove this C and continue recursively on the remaining game on V minus C. And I do this over and over again. And this is again, very much like the case with Cookie. So at every iteration of this, you are either finding at least one new vertex that player two has a winning strategy from, or you're just getting to the end. And let's just analyze the end. So if we don't find any vertices from which player two wins anymore, this basically means a case where B2 is empty, right? Because B2 itself is a subset of C. So if B2 is empty, then this is the situation that I am in. And basically what this means is that I had this set P0, I computed its attractor for player one, which was A, I computed the trap. And then in the sub game in that trap, player one wins everywhere. Okay, so my claim in this case is that, well, player one has a memoryless st winning strategy from every vertex, and this is in the original game. Okay, now why? Well, we can easily come up with the strategies, right? Okay, so first of all, if the game starts somewhere in B, player one can just play his strategy in the sub game. And note that the sub game here, this B was a trap for player one. It's not a trap for player two. 
So player two might have a way of going out of this. But if player two does not go out, then player one wins with the strategy that he had here. If player two goes out, or if the game starts somewhere outside of B, then well, player one can just use the memoryless strategy for reachability to force the game to get into P0, right? So that's what player one does. Player one forces the game to go into P0. And then the game stays in P0 for a while, maybe for one step, maybe for a thousand steps. And then at some point it goes out of P0 again. And if it goes out of P0 into A, again, player one forces the game back to P0. If it goes out of P0 into B, player one plays his strategy for B and waits until either he wins in B or player two puts us back into A. So in any case, player one is going to win this game. And the only choice that player two has is to keep the game in B and lose here or push the game back into A infinitely many times and then lose here basically by C zero infinitely many times. So with this really simple strategy, which is also memoryless, uh, player one wins the game. Okay, so what did we do now? We basically proved determinacy, right? Because we started with this game and we just took these chunks, these C sets out. And every time we said that player two wins in these C sets that we are removing, and after all these were removed, we proved that player one wins in everything that he makes. So not only we found an algorithm, we actually showed that uh, the games are determined and they are memoryless determined because all of the strategies that we found for the two players were memoryless. Okay. So what is the runtime of this algorithm? And this is a very simple and classical analysis. And I'm not going to do this for you because it's just solving recursions, but basically you can write the runtime like this. So you can consider the runtime as a function of number of vertices, number of edges and number of priorities. And based on what we did, you can actually find this recursion, I should say less than or equal. So uh, at every, uh, every time here that I'm removing one of these C sets, it's taking order M time. And I also have to solve a sub game, which is T of N, M and D minus one at most. And I have to do this N times at most because well, every time I do it, I find at least one vertex from which player two wins and I have at most N vertices. And the base case is basically the runtime for Bookie. We actually saw how we can reduce this to N squared in the last session, but even if you use order N, M, with another induction, you can show that this is at most order n to the power of d minus one times m overall. Okay. So, and with this, I'm going to basically wrap up this module. Uh, let me just remind you what we did. We defined two player games on graphs. Our graphs themselves were finite, but the games were played for an infinite duration. We defined all no classical notions, objective, zero sum, strategy, blah, blah. And for some of the classical strategies, we showed how we can actually solve these things. And by solve, I mean find meaning set of every player. And our runtimes were like this. So for reachability and safety, we showed that the game can be solved in linear time. For Buki and Kobuki, we had a classical algorithm that took order n m, and then we had the hierarchical decomposition algorithm, which took order n squared. And now for parity with d priorities, we found an algorithm that solves it in order n to the power of d minus one times m. Now, a question that comes to mind is, so what's the motivation for studying these objectives? Why did we even bother? So the simplest case is reachability and safety. So the motivation for studying reachability is that, well, you can consider the states of the game as being states of your program, and you want to see if you can reach some bad state if, if your program has a bug. And safety is, of course, it's dual. You want to see if you can prove that the program never reaches a bad state. But then as we go to more complex objectives, the motivation also becomes weirder. So if you think about Buki 
and try to continue with the same example as before. It's basically asking if you uh, reach the buggy states infinitely many times, or if you reach them only finitely many times. Uh, this is actually interesting for some people in software engineering because, well, if you can prove Kobuki, what you're proving is that if you test your software for long enough and you don't see any bugs, then you are sure that from that point onwards, you will not see any bugs. So that's the idea of Kobuki. It basically characterizes the set of problems that are testable in a way. But then when it comes to parity, I can't really give you any kind of intuition like this. Basically, the idea is that it's really expressive. And later on in this course, we're going to see some logics. For example, we're going to see the linear temporal logic. And being able to solve parity games helps us do model checking on those logics. So the real motivation behind parity will mostly get clear as we go through with this course. And this is actually also true between the modules. So at this point, maybe you think that these games are just fun and like nice mathematics, but they don't matter. But as we go on, you will see a lot of use cases of these. And with this, I'm going to finish the module on uh, infinite duration games. And now I'm going to go through with the next module, which is Automata on Infinite Words. Let me see how much time we have. Okay, we have some time still. So are there any questions until this point? Can you explain the running time again? Ah, okay. Okay, so uh, this is the base case. So if you have two priorities, it's just bookie and we had an algorithm that solved in order. Otherwise, in this case, the algorithm that we had was basically find this set C and remove it over and over again. And then again, find another C and remove it, right? So how many times do we do this? We do this at most N times because every time we do this, we are removing vertices that are in the winning set of player two, right? And how much time does it take? So we do it n times. And how much time does it take to do this? Well, we have to solve this sub game, right, recursively. And that takes at most t of n, m, and d minus 1. Because I, I don't know what happens to my vertices and edges, but I know that I have at least one fewer priority, right? And then I also had some small computations of attractors here, right? And this computation of attractors takes order M according to our algorithm for reachability. So overall we have this uh, inequality, right? Yeah. So you have this uh, recursive definition, you have this inequality and the base case and you can just guess it and do an induction and prove that this holds. Or you can just use some variants of master's theorem. It's basically master's theorem, except that you have more than one variable. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so I, this is just induction. And I didn't want to do another induction. Okay, any other questions? Uh, so just one th thing that I remembered is this. So. If you look at this runtime that we have for parity, this is actually exponential, right? Because in the worst case, we don't really have a bound on D and we might have N different values for it, right? So this is in the worst case, like order N to the power of N times N. And the state of the art has actually reduced this to order, sorry, to N to the power of order square root of n. So this is the best algorithm that we have for parity. I'm not going to cover it, but you can just search sub-exponential algorithm for parity games and you will find this. In cases where, you're, where the number of parities are high, this actually makes sense. But in most of our use cases, you will see that we have very few parities. So in our use cases, D is never more than maybe four or five. So for us, the classical algorithm is better. Okay, 
So let's go to the next module. Okay. So the next thing that I want to talk to you in this course about is uh, automata on infinite words. And this is basically where you will see some use cases of the algorithms that we had for solving infinite games. But then this module itself is the theory behind the next module where we want to go to logics. Okay. So just a small refresher. Uh, I'm sure you all know what automata and finite words are and how they work. So we basically have two main classical varieties. We have deterministic finite automaton and we have non-deterministic finite automaton. And just to make sure that we use the same notation, a deterministic finite automaton consists of these parts. Uh, it basically has a finite alphabet of letters, which we show by sigma. It has a finite set of states, which I show by Q. There is some initial state, which I show by Q0, this is the initial state. And there's also a trans transition function that at every state, reading every letter tells you which other state you have to go to. And of course, you also have a set of accepting states. And the idea is that when you are given a finite word, you start from the start state, read the word letter by letter, and move according to the transition function and then look where you end up. If you end up in an accepting state, the word is accepted. If you end up in a rejecting state, the word is rejected. So basically a word is accepted if the unique run with that word ends in an accepting state, okay? So for example, uh, what words are accepted by this automaton? And well, there is no. So basically, it's uh, yeah, it's every word that has at least one one, right? Okay, and so we also have this notion of language. Basically, the language of an automaton is the set of words that are accepted by that automaton. So the language of this automaton is basically all words that have at least one letter one. In and we also had an extension of this, which was non-deterministic finite automaton. The differences here are quite minor, actually. And the difference is that you can have several starting vertices. So Q0 is no longer just one vertex. It's a set of vertices, a set of initial states. And also the transition function is now more general. So from every state reading every word, it gives you a set of possible successor states. And the idea is that you can basically choose which one of these you want to take. And so because you have these choices, because you have a choice of the starting state and also a choice of where to go at every transition, you have many different runs using the same word. So then we define uh, acceptance as follows. We say that a word is accepted if there is at least one run using that word that ends in an accepting state. So for example, if you consider uh, the word zero one in this automaton, I can start here, go zero and then one, and this is accepting, so the word is accepted. I might have other runs that are not accepting, for example, zero one, and this doesn't really matter. As long as there is at least one run that accepts, the whole world is, a, the whole world is accepted and is in the language of the automaton. I actually don't know why I wrote Q0 both here and here, but yeah, that doesn't really matter. Okay, so now let's see how we can extend this to infinite words. So what do we mean by infinite words? We basically mean that the input to the automaton is no longer finite. It's an infinite sequence of letters. So in this case, again, my uh, alphabet is just zero and one. So the input is an infinite sequence of zeros and ones. Now, if you look at the definitions that we had for finite automaton, everything works here. You can basically start and it doesn't matter that the input is infinite. You can just run it, right? You can run it very normally. And the only problem is that, well, your run will also be infinite. 
So in the deterministic case, you will have a unique run, but the run is infinite. In the non-deterministic case, you can have many runs, maybe even infinitely many runs, and all of the runs are infinite. So everything works. The only thing that doesn't actually work is the acceptance condition, because our acceptance condition was that we said a run is accepting if it ends in an accepting state, right? And then we said a word is accepted if it has an accepting run. But here, all of our runs are infinite, so it doesn't make sense to talk about their last state. So the only thing that we have to change when we go from finite words to infinite words, which we also call it the omega automata, uh, and this is actually the first infinite ordinal for those of you who've read set theory, so that's why we use omega. But for others, just think of omega as meaning an infinite sequence. So everything works except for the acceptance condition. So we have to come up with some acceptance conditions to say which words are actually accepted by the automaton and which are not. Okay, uh, we have time. Okay. So how do we define an automaton on infinite words? Well, it's basically the same as automaton finite words. It has two flavors, deterministic and non-deterministic. And it has the exact same parts, except that it also now has an additional acceptance condition at the end. So the acceptance condition is what tells us which runs are accepted. Now, what should this acceptance condition look like? Well, the first thing that people usually come up with is reachability. They, somehow people think that uh, a run should be accepted if it visits one of the accepting states. But if you do that, you really get useless automata. And you can try it like hey, everything becomes very easy and basically just like the finite case if you look at reachability. So reachability is not interesting at all. What we actually like for our accepting conditions are bookie and parity. So here's how it works. So in case of a bookie automata, you basically have a set T of accepting states and a run of the automaton is accepting if it visits T infinitely many times, if it visits T infinitely often. So this is just like the bookie condition in our games, right? So now consider this automaton, which was the same thing that I asked you uh, previously about. So, but now consider it as a bookie automaton. So what is the language of this bookie automata? What infinite words are accepted by this bookie automata? No, well, I mean, Q1 is the only accepting state. So you can say that uh, a run is accepting if it visits Q1 infinitely many times. But I just want a description of the language itself. So sorry. Uh, has no. So it has to visit Q1 infinitely many times, right? And if it comes to Q1, then it will visit Q1 infinitely many times because there is no way to go anywhere else from Q1. So again, it's just the set of infinite words that have at least one one, right? So in this case, coincidentally, they are the same, but we will see many examples that they don't really look like each other. Okay, and just like the finite case, we can have non-deterministic bookie automaton or deterministic bookie automaton. And again, in case of non-deterministic automaton, it accepts an infinite word if there is at least one accepting run on that infinite word, okay? And of course, we can define a parity automaton very similarly. Basically, a parity automaton, instead of having a bunch of accepting states, has a priority function that assigns a priority to every state of the automaton. And then a run is accepting if it satisfies the parity condition, which means that if the smallest priority that is seen infinitely many times is even. 
So that's the definition of parity automata. For now, we're going to mostly focus on bookie. Parity is something that we will come back to in the next sessions. So we can have deterministic or non-deterministic, bookie or parity. And we basically use these abbreviations. So DBW is deterministic bookie automaton. I don't know why they use W. It's just that some guy did it back in the 1950s and everyone else is doing it. And some people find meanings for this, but it really doesn't have any meaning. They just didn't want to use A because they didn't want it to be confused with finite automaton. So this is deterministic bookie automaton. We can have non-deterministic bookie automaton or NBW. And then we can have the parity versions, deterministic parity automaton, non-deterministic parity automaton. Okay. So time for some contribution from the students. So let's say that these automata are all bookie automata. And I want you to tell me what kind of languages they actually accept. So what is the language of this automata? Uh, no. So it actually doesn't quite make sense to say even or odd here because there might be infinitely many. No, I mean, a string is accepted if it visits this state infinitely many times, right? Okay. So what should that string be? Yeah. No, well, we have, an, we have infinite strings, right? Okay. This is a bookie automaton, so you have to give me a set of infinite strings. Okay, yes, the answers in the chat are actually correct. So this automaton accepts all uh, sequences or all words or strings that have infinitely many ones, right? And you can see that, well, if I have only finitely many ones, I cannot visit this vertex infinitely many times because every visit should come with a one, right? And if I have infinitely many ones, the first time I see a one, I go here, then I might waste some of my ones and go back. But then again, I will definitely see another one in the future because I have infinitely many of them. So I will always see another one in the future and I will come back here. So I will visit this infinitely many times. So this automaton accepts all words that have infinitely many ones. Okay, how about this next one? How about this one? Uh, so this one was non-determinist. No, no, this one. Yes, it's non-deterministic because from this vertex with zero and one, you can either go to itself or you can go to the other. Okay, and another point here is that from this vertex, I don't have any out edge labeled with zero. And what I mean about for that is that basically it goes to some rejecting sink. So you can assume that there is some other state that only has edges to itself. And then with zero from here, I just go to that other state. So if I see a zero when I'm here, the run is projecting. Okay. So one of the answers says after finite links, it is all ones. Yes, that's actually correct. This is basically encoding something like a co-wookie, right? So you can just, uh, cycle here for a finite amount of time. And then at some point you have to take this edge. And when you take this edge, you have to only see once, otherwise it gets rejected, right? So this automaton accepts all infinite strings that have a finite prefix that can be anything, but at some point it switches to one and it remains one until the end forever. Okay, how about this third one? Uh, what strings are accepted by this automata? Uh, well, wouldn't that be all strings? It's 
So do you think it accepts all of the strings? And it should at least have one one, right, for it to go here. Okay, so what happens if I have infinitely many ones? I can go here, come back, go there again. So if I have infinitely many ones, it definitely accepts, right? But that's not the only requirement because I can have a single one and then I can just rotate here with zeros. Uh, it should be odd. Yes. Yeah, so it basically accepts the strings that either have infinitely many ones, in which case it can go through this cycle, or if they have finitely many ones, they should have an odd number of ones so that it goes here and then reads these zeros and remains here forever. Okay, so you're seeing that th these automata are quite expressive and with just two states, we can say so many things. Okay, how about this large one here? The one with three states. What is the language of this automata? So let's see what it does. Zero. Sorry? Not really, because, well, we can't count in the automaton, right? So I can come here and just ignore a lot of ones. So basically what happens is that we start here, we can ignore a bunch of zeros, right? And then when we read a one, we go here, then we can ignore a bunch of ones. And then we get zero and go back. So basically the idea here is that it accepts the set of strings that do not have infinitely many continuous zeros or infinitely many continuous ones, right? So every continuous set of zeros or ones is finite. And you can check that. If, if you have such a string, then you first go through the first zero part here then read the one, go through the first one part here, then go to zero. This doesn't really matter. I mean, you can always see that it works. Yeah. So it basically, uh, or in other words, it accepts the set of strings that have what? Infinitely many zeros and infinitely many ones. Infinitely many ones, then and this one zero at the end. Yes, so, so the, there should be infinitely many zeros and infinitely many ones, but it, it shouldn't have an infinite tail that is all zero or all one, right? But the fact that you have infinitely many zeros and infinitely many ones also tells you that you don't have an infinite tail. Because if you have an infinite tail of ones, you cannot have infinitely many zeros. So basically it accepts all strings that have infinitely many zeros and infinitely many ones. Okay, what about this last one? So what is the language of this automaton? Yes, it accepts a string if it has infinite many ones. So the language of this automaton is actually the same as the language of the first automaton that we had here. And I really wanted to show you this because in case of finite automata, those of you who have uh, gone deeper into it know that each language has a canonical smallest automaton. This is not the case in the in, in, in infinite bookie automata. So you can have two different automata, both of them with only two states that accept the same language. 
right? So these are both minimal automata for that language. Okay, uh, let's see how much time now. Okay, if you have time to go through this proof, great. So another point about, uh, another main difference between automata on infinite words and on finite words is that in, in the finite case, you don't really get any more expressiveness out of the non-determinism. So I guess you've all seen this theorem that uh, any language that is accepted by an NFA also has a DFA that accepts the exact same language. So you can basically, uh, remove the non-determinism. Of course, it comes at a cost. Your uh, state space becomes much larger. For example, if you've seen this subset construction. But in the end, the point is that the expressiveness of deterministic finite automata and non-deterministic finite automata is the same. If you have a language that has an NFA, it definitely also has a DFA. Now, what I'm going to show you is that this is not the case for infinite words, especially for Kuki automata. And here's the, the example. So again, consider this example that we had before. So what was the language of this automaton? It is basically, uh, yeah, it's the set of all words that have finitely many zeros, right? Because we read a finite prefix here, and then at some point we go here, and when we go to this accepting state, we should only read one. So it accepts all strings uh, that have only finitely many zeros. And note that this is a non-deterministic Fuki automata, right? Uh, why is this non-deterministic Fuki automata? Because, well, from this vertex with letter zero, you can go back to itself or go to the other one. So it's non-deterministic. But I'm going to prove to you using something that is very similar to pumping lemma that there is no deterministic Fuki automaton for this language, okay? And uh, well, for the proof, I guess I used the whiteboard. Uh, I'm going to stop this. Uh, can I make it so that I see myself here? So there is no stop sharing, it's just all yeah, sure. it's the red one. The red one. Oh, yeah, okay. But, uh, Okay, so let me try to do this on the board here and hopefully people on Zoom can also see it. I have actually put a sketch of, of the proof in the lecture so you can see that. Okay, so the language that we have is basically the set of, let's see where I can go, this is the border. Okay. So we want to accept uh, all the strings. Uh, all strings with uh, finitely many zeros. Okay. So, what is the simplest string that I am sure should be accepted? Well, the string that consists only of ones. So, if I have a string that is all one, this should definitely be accepted. So let's do a proof by contradiction and let's say that we have a deterministic Fuki automaton that accepts this language. And let's call our deterministic Fuki automaton A and let's say that it has n different states. Okay. So this automaton should accept this infinite string, which is all ones. Uh, so because it's a Buki automaton, this means that when, when I run this string through the automaton, it should at some point reach an accepting state, right? And remember that our automaton is deterministic, so it has a unique run on this. So let's say that the first accepting state is somewhere here, for example, at index called I zero, right? 
Now I create another string that should be accepted, and this is basically a bunch of ones, i zero different ones, and then I put a zero here, and then I continue again with all ones. So this string has only one zero, so it should be accepted, right? So at some point after this zero, the automaton should again reach a reach another accepting state, right? So I call that other point that I reach an accepting state I want. And I just continue this. So I put this string back and then I put the I one ones. And then I put another zero and then I put infinitely many ones. Right. And using this, I can again find another index I two that reaches an accepting state. I can do this as many times as I want, but I do it n plus one times. Okay, so I do this until I get to I n. Now, the point is that I know that at each one of these uh, indices, I actually reached an accepting state. And I also know that there are at most n different states. So, two of these indices should have reached the same accepting state. So let's say that, I don't know, let's say I n and I two were the same accepting state. So what I can do is that I can just put the prefix up to I two, uh, whatever I had before I two, I put it here. And then just repeat whatever I had between I two and I n infinitely many times. Right. So what happens is that in a run of the program, I start and when I get to index I2, I'm at some accepting state. Let's call it state Q or whatever. Okay. And then when I I know that starting from Q, if I do this uh, this finite string from I2 to I n, I come back to Q. Right. So if I do this infinitely many times, I just visit Q infinitely many times. And this string should be accepted by my deterministic Fuki automaton because Q was, ex was an accepting state and I'm visiting it infinitely many times. But the thing is, between each one of these uh, I indices, I put a zero. So when I do this, I see infinitely many zeros. So this contradiction shows that my automaton, my deterministic Fuki automaton, has to accept the string that I just created. That has infinitely many zeros. This is a contradiction, so we don't have such a deterministic Fuji automaton. Okay. Uh, so let's go back to the slides. This is basically what I tried to write here as well. So as you see, we have this very simple non-deterministic Fuji automaton, and it has no deterministic equivalent automaton. So the take home point here is that when it comes to at least Buki automata, non-deterministic Buki automata are strictly more expressive than deterministic Buki automata. So the non-determinism actually matters. And here's the definition. We say that the language is omega regular if it is the language of a non-deterministic Buki automata. So in the finite case, we had this concept of regular languages, and these were the languages of either an NFA or a DFA. But now here, because there is a difference, we have to make a choice, and the natural choice is to get the non-deterministic one. So whenever I say I have an omega regular language, what I mean is that I have a non-deterministic Fuki automaton that accepts that language. Okay. So. The questions that come to mind, the very first questions that come to mind are the same questions that you probably answered the first time that you saw finite automata. And it's whether the languages of these automata are actually closed under set operations. So let's first consider the deterministic Fuki case. So let's say that X is the set of all languages that can be recognized by some deterministic Fuki automata. So first of all, X is not closed under complementation. Why? 
because we just saw the example. So this language, this was uh, the language of uh, all streams that have finitely many zeros, right? And we saw that it doesn't have a DBW, but you can easily create a DBW for the language of strings that have infinitely many zeros, right? So it's not closed under complementation. It's actually closed under union. So this is a very simple structure. It's basically uh, multiplying the two uh, automata together. So let's say that you have two different DVWs, A1 and A2, and they have all the normal parts, except that I write Q1 for the set of states in the first automaton, and I write Q01 for its initial state, and I write delta one and T1. So, so here's the thing. You have two deterministic Fokke automaton, and you want to get their union. What can you do? You can just put them side by side and run them side by side, and accept if at least one of them accepts, right? How do you do this? Very easily. So if one of them accepts, what does that mean? It means that you should accept if in one of the two automata, you see uh, the accepting state infinitely many times. So what you can do is that basically you can define the set of states of your union automaton to be the cross multiplication of the two sets and the initial state is the same. And the targets are basically these. So a vertex is a target. If either its first component was a target in the first automaton or its second, second component was a target in the second automaton. So it's T1 times Q2 union with Q1 times T2, okay? And the transitions are just following the transitions of the original one. So if you are at a state Q, Q prime and you read a letter A, in the first component, you do what the first automaton would do. And in the second component, you do what the second one does, right? So we're just simulating the two automata side by side. And we're saying that, okay, if in this simulation, I see these states infinitely many times, then it means that I am either seeing T1 infinitely many times with some random value from Q2, or I'm seeing T2 infinitely many times with some random value from Q1. So this is basically union of the two, okay? So the set X is actually closed under union. It's also closed under intersection. And I'm not going to give you uh, the solution for that because the solution to that is basically exercise two in the homework that is due tonight. Uh, let's see if I can show you the exercise. Okay, so exercise two was this. It said, consider a variant of the bouquet objective in the games where you have two different sets, T1 and T2, and your objective is to visit each of them infinitely often. And it asks you for an algorithm. And this is exactly intersection, right? Because you have two different automata and you want to visit the accepting states of each one of them infinitely often. So you have two different sets that you want to visit infinitely often. This is the same as that exercise. So I'll probably never show you the solution. Uh, okay. And um, now let's go to the nicer case. Let's go to the case with non-deterministic Bukio automaton. Uh, and again, let X be the set of omega regular languages now, which is basically the languages that can be accepted by a non-deterministic Fuki automaton. X is actually closed under complementation, but this needs a whole session and I will probably spend the whole session proving this to you. Uh, but let's see the other two cases. So the closure under intersection is again, the homework that you have to do tonight. So I'm not going to go through that, but it's actually also closed under union. And the closure under union in this case is much easier. So in, in the case of non-deterministic automata, the thing is that you don't have a single starting state, right? You can have a set of starting states. 
So if you want to take the union of two automata, you can just put them right next to each other and just take the union of starting states. And this is exactly what I'm doing. So I'm just taking the union of, uh, oh, okay, there is something wrong here. So the set of states is the union of states. And uh, yeah, okay, yeah, that's fine actually. And the starting states are the union of the starting states of the two. So basically you put the two automata right next to each other. At the very beginning of the run, you decide whether you want to start in this automaton or you want to start in this automaton. And then you just run it. And this is union. Okay, does this make sense? Great. Uh, okay, and I'm just going to show you a little bit of uh, this thing that I told you takes a whole session, basically doing complementation. I want to do a very simple case of complementation. So let's say that I have a deterministic Fuki automaton. And I want to compute the complement of this deterministic automaton. So I want to find another automaton B such that the language of B is the complement of the language of A. And as we saw before, because deterministic automata are not closed under complementation, I cannot expect my complement to also be deterministic. So the idea is that I'm given a deterministic automaton, but the complement automaton that I'm outputting would be a non-deterministic automaton B. Okay, and let's just look at an example and then this gives us all the ideas that we need. So here's an example. Uh, what was this? This was the automaton that accepted the string if it had infinitely many zeros, right? And this is the automaton that accepts the string if it has only finitely many zeros. So this automaton is actually the complement of that one. And of course it's non-deterministic because we showed we cannot have a deterministic one. Okay, but what is the idea here? The idea here is that basically uh, in, in this one, in the original language, I had to see zero infinitely many times. So in the complement, what I'm going to do is that I'm going to create this kind of cycle that basically ignores a prefix. And then I'm going to say at some point you have to commit and go to the other side. And as soon as you commit and go to the other side, you cannot see zeros anymore. Right? This is the idea in this complementation. So we can actually do this with any automaton. So let's say that I have this deterministic book automaton A. What I do is that I just take two copies of A, put them side by side. And what I say is that, okay, you can continue running inside of the first copy, but at some point you have to commit to exiting the first copy and going to the second copy. And when you make this commitment, you cannot see any of the original target states anymore. So basically the way I'm defining B is that I'm taking two copies of the original uh, automaton. I'm calling them copy one and copy two. Basically, this is why I have one and two here. And the second copy does not have the uh, original target vertices, right? And I start in copy one. And I can just run it at every step. I can either run inside copy one itself, or I can say at this point, I commit to going into copy two. So this is what I'm saying here. So at each point, you can either just remain in copy one or go to copy two. But as soon as you go into copy two, you no longer have those T vertices. You no longer can visit those, right? And what is our target set now? What vertices do we want to visit infinitely many times in this whole larger automaton? Well, uh, we just want to visit the second copy infinitely many times, right? So the idea is that I'm just running the same automaton, but at some point I am saying, okay, enough is enough. I'm not going to see any target states anymore. And this is where I go to the second. So you can very easily just do definition chasing. I'm sure that uh, the language of B is actually the complement of the language of A. But again, it's very important to notice that B is a non-deterministic automaton. 
So at every state when you are in part one, you have at least two different transitions. And you basically have the choice of remaining in part one or committing to going to part two. Just like here, you had the choice of remaining in this state or committing and going to the other state. And if you don't have this kind of non-determinism, you will not be able to do the complementation again because of this proof that we had here that there is no equivalent automaton for this in the deterministic world. Okay, uh, so any questions? Okay, uh, so if there are no questions, you can leave and I'll just drop, I, I'm here and if you come up with any questions I can answer, I'll stay for five or six more minutes. <laughs>